If it's all right with you, I'm going to go ahead and begin. We'll start this so we have a little bit more time. Um, I want to thank you for uh, coming today. Obviously, it's because of you that we're here. I'd like to welcome you to our discussion on social services and accessing community-based agencies. My name is Elaine Serrani, and I'm a founding member of this uh, group. I encourage you to participate in the Q&A. <clears throat> Let us know what you're coming up against, what's happening with you at work, and what kind of referrals you need or what kind of referrals you can lend to us. There's bound to be someone here at the conference or at your vendor tables or out on this stage, this I know to be true, who can help you, give you some good feedback, or give you some really good referrals. So don't be shy about coming up and meeting the panel afterwards and getting their card. <clears throat> I'm going to go quickly so that we can have a lot of time for, um, for our Q&A. Our collaborative was founded on the premise that representatives from all areas of interest in women's health saw value in promoting better access for health care for lesbian and bisexual women, who, who are a historically marginalized group inside an historically marginalized group. Our focus is to educate healthcare providers, administrators, social workers, and their staff on the statistical evidence of the healthcare needs of lesbians and bisexual women, promoting and sharing each other's experience in order to learn, gather new support referrals, and endeavor to become more informed so that we might better serve these women. This is uh, one of the sharing of your personal experience portions of the conference that you might get some support and feedback from our panel, and our main interest is the dignity and the welfare of your patients. Again, my name is Elaine Serrani. I've been a respiratory therapist for over 40 years. I have worked in patient care ever since I was 17 years old. Um, I have a long history of volunteering in the gay and lesbian community, which began in the 1980s during the AIDS crisis. I identify as a bisexual lesbian, uh, my meaning of that is that most of my sexual relationships have been with men, but my most emotionally collect, connected and longest primary sexual relationships have been with women. I will add for clarification, not at the same time. <laughs> Being bisexual does not mean you are not monogamous. It means that you are sexually attracted to both men and women. That's all. <laughs> I was reared as a strict Catholic girl in Riverside area here, uh, then became a born-again evangelical Christian in 1972 in Long Beach, California, during the Jesus Movement with Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa. For four years, I wrote and co-hosted and starred in Trinity Broadcasting Network's live Saturday morning children's television show, KPTL, Kids Praise the Lord. I also produce Lloyd Ogilvie's Sunday morning TV program, Let God Love You, right here at Hollywood Presbyterian Church on Gower, until the point that he became chaplain of the United States Senate. For me, it was decades of first being secretly in love with a woman that I had my first lesbian relationship at the age of 26. In 2009, I was invited to join this group as it was forming. At that time, I was chair of the California Commission on the Status of Women, having been appointed by Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. I had held the first ever public hearings on the status of lesbians in the state capitol. I helped create the California Women Veterans Conference, now in its 12th year, and I was a public speaker for several years at high schools and colleges for GLIDE, Gays and Lesbians Initiating Dialogue for Equality. <clears throat> In a nutshell, that's a little bit about my personal background, and it demonstrates that being human is complex. Sometimes the best that we can hope for as caregivers is to do no harm. Today we have four richly versatile guests who work in various areas of LGBT social work, from senior care to finding foster parents for gay teens, 
to helping couples adopt a baby, to community health, to mental health access, and to the legal aspects of lesbian and queer life from the domestic abuse to survivor benefit. All of your questions will be welcomed by these skilled and committed professionals, and we are lucky to have them here today. The guests will first introduce themselves, and I'm going to ask them a couple of questions. We'll open it up to the audience. This is a judgment-free zone, right? So share your dilemmas. If you would rather not speak into a mic, which will be going around, write it down on the card, <clears throat> pass it to one of the volunteers, or bring it up to me, and I'll ask the question for you. But ask your questions. That's what you're here for. That's what will help us the best. So my esteemed panel, <laughs> if you please speak up into the microphone when you talk. And kindly, if you're having trouble hearing, very kindly say, louder, please. That will help us do a better job for you. And we're going to start with three or four minutes of you telling us what you do for a living and a little bit, if you're comfortable, maybe how you identify or something else personal about your life so that we can all get to know you a little bit better, too. First, Danny. Good morning. Can you hear me? All right. Uh, good morning. My name is Danny Sesenya. Um, I identify as gender queer. I am also AFAB, assigned female at birth, and I am in a queer relationship with a beautiful bisexual woman. I work for the California LGBTQ Health and Human Services Network, and what we do is that we are a statewide organization that brings together 60 plus LGBTQ organizations and advocacy groups and provide resources, funding opportunities, and collect data on LGBTQ Californians so that way more funding can be released um, to our community to uh, reduce healthcare disparities. Hello, good morning everyone. My name is Mieko Faley. I use she, her pronouns. And I'm the director of legal services at the LGBTQ Center in Long Beach. Um, I'm an attorney overseeing comprehensive and holistic direct legal assistance to LGBTQ survivors of violence, including domestic violence, sexual violence, hate violence, police misconduct, human trafficking, arson, physical assault, um, and all of the different ways that uh, queer and trans people um, experience violence. I identify as queer. Uh, which means that my sexual orientation is person-based. Um, my prior experience work is um, having worked with the Center for Juvenile Law and Policy with folks who were wrongfully convicted or unfairly sentenced as juveniles, so criminal defense sentencing reduction, as well as with the American Civil Liberties Union on the LGBTQ Student Rights Project and with the Los Angeles LGBT Center for more than seven years, including as their lead attorney and overseeing all their domestic and sexual violence legal programming. Um, throughout my career, I've trained hundreds, um, I've trained thousands of providers locally across the state and nationally, including with the American Bar Association and for the state's California Office of Emergency Services. And I've worked with hundreds of LGBTQ survivors of violence. I'm really glad to be here with all of you today. Hi, I'm Robin Herod. Um, I'm an LCSW. Um, I identify as lesbian. I have a 22-year-old trans son who gave me permission to be able to announce that. Um, I have to check with him for a lot of things <laughs> before I say or do them these days. Um, so my background is mostly in the world of foster care and adoption. So I've been doing it for about 25 years. I spent five years at the Department of Children and Family Services in their adoptions division. And that's when it was a little bit more separate than it is now from foster care. Now it's much more um, entwined with each other. Then 15 years as the director of a foster care and adoption agency. So we are a nonprofit agency most of the kids that we worked with were part of the DCFS system. So the adoptions were through foster care. 
Um, my agency was the first one to actually go out and recruit in the LGBTQ community for parents. So at that point, um, it was not legal for same-sex couples to adopt. Um, but we kind of worked our way around it with one judge at children's court. Um, and we were able to do it um, through a few different ways. Um, so we'll there for 15 years and then for the past four years I've pretty much been on my own so I have a private practice I work with um, a lot of LGBT people who are trying to figure out how to form their family so I kind of help them navigate that process I'm working with a lot of the kids that I actually placed 15 and 20 years ago who are now young adults um, teenagers who need someone to talk to about their adoption issues. I work with parents who, um, you know, post adoption who are, you know, just looking at LGBT, LGBT parenting issues um, and adoption issues. And then I also work with, I'm licensed with the state of California to work with birth parents and usually birth moms who are not involved with DCFS, but they're making a choice to place their babies for adoption. And the state mandates that they actually have counseling with um, an adoption service provider. So they have somebody supporting them, whereas the attorneys are usually supporting the adoptive parents. So I think that. Good, good morning, everyone. I'm Kira Pollack. I'm the director of senior services at the Los Angeles LGBT Center. I'm 39 years old. Um, I say that on purpose because I work with seniors and we work in a, we live in a culture that's very focused on age and age discrimination. Um, and I wonder how many folks in this audience would voluntarily tell folks their age. Um, but I think it makes a tremendous difference when we're talking about age and age discrimination for more of us to start doing that. Um, I live in the Valley. I have a seven-year-old, and I'm bisexual. Um, I'm new to Los Angeles. I just moved here two years ago for this position. Um, and I work with um, a large number of LGBT seniors, um, close to 6,000 of them, um, who are primarily identify as LGBT in Los Angeles. Um, the Los Angeles LGBT Center has um, a robust senior program. We have a senior center. We um, have Triangle Square Apartments, which is the first affordable housing complex um, in the nation for LGBT seniors in Hollywood. Um, and we're in the process of opening up a um, intergenerational campus in four weeks time, um, which will pair housing opportunities, affordable housing for seniors, and also um, crisis shelter and transitional shelter for um, transition age youth um, in our community. Um, as well as wraparound employment and social support services. Thank you. Are you getting hungry to ask questions now? <laughs> it's a good group. Start writing those questions down. <clears throat> when I first came out, there was a saying in the gay community, a black child is born into a black family and is shown the ropes on how to navigate in a hostile world. But a gay child is born into the enemy camp and learns to hide in order to survive. It's little wonder that substance abuse and mental health issues from nonstop societal bashing are major issues in the gay community. In the last two years, nine states have adopted laws giving individuals and businesses a right to discriminate against people like me. They are legally able to refuse to hire me, refuse to rent to me. They can legally refuse to treat me in a hospital or to refuse to serve me in a restaurant. A lifetime of hearing your parents, your teachers, your pastors, your politicians, and your coworkers tell you that you are mentally ill, perverted, hated by God, not worthy of love, or not worthy of even public civility, does damage. It is no surprise that mental health issues, depression, smoking, drinking, and drug use have plagued the LGBT community. 
for the panel. How are lesbian, bisexual, and queer women disproportionately affected by barriers to physical and mental health? Um, I don't mind speaking for my wife and myself. Um, one of the things with um, being part of the LGBTQ community, especially being a bisexual or queer woman, is constantly having to out yourself. You know, you're always outing yourself to your physicians, to your mental health providers, anywhere you go. And every time you out yourself, there's a little bit of trauma that comes along with it because providers do not know how to react. Right away, it's like, oh, well, um, okay, so does this mean you don't sleep with men or do you sleep with men? And I don't know how many times I have heard when I have asked for a pap smear being told you do not need it because you're not sleeping with men. And it's like, but wait, I'm still at risk for cervical cancer or ovarian cancer. It runs in my family. And I would have to fight and advocate for myself just to obtain a pap smear. And then once I'm finally able to get the referral authorized, then finding a gynecologist that's even willing to treat me, who doesn't feel weirded out because my presentation does come across as male sometimes. And then sometimes, you know, we need birth control or my wife needs birth control because her hormones are off and doctors denying her the birth control. So every time we are denied services, we also have trauma happen to us because now we're scared. We have anxiety going to the physician. And now we need, need to find a mental health provider that understands this consistent re-traumatization that we go through to help us work through it and to help us ease our anxiety and figure out ways that we can discuss with our providers the healthcare needs that we need access to. When I think about the issues that disproportionately affect um, lesbian and bisexual women and folks who are trans non-binary, um, for me, given my practice uh, and field, one of the first things that comes to mind is the issue of violence. Um, and from my perspective, if we look at the numbers, and I'm going to cover the numbers briefly, um, domestic violence, sexual violence, hate violence are epidemics and public health concerns that affect um, LGBTQ communities. Um, the Center for Disease Control did a study that looked at the lifetime prevalence of domestic violence, including physical assault, sexual violence, and stalking over the, uh, the lifetime of LGBTQ people. And what that study found is some really startling numbers, specifically when we look at folks who identify as bisexual or lesbian. Um, the lifetime prevalence of domestic violence, including sexual violence for bisexual women, is as high as 61%. That's nearly double the rate for um, heterosexual women. That's startlingly high. The rates for lesbians are as high as 43% or folks who identify as lesbian. Now, the Center for Disease Control did not account for gender identity, which is a huge problem and really reveals the cultural sanctioning of violence that we see against trans folks, folks who are gender queer, gender non-binary, not tracking what that violence looks like for folks who also identify as lesbian and bisexual is hugely problematic. And so a lot of folks have come together to track what uh, that violence looks like, including the National Coalition of Anti-Violence Programs, um, which found the lifetime prevalence of domestic violence, including sexual violence for trans people, is as high as 54%. And so we're comparing rates to het cis communities, which ranges from about 25 to 33%. And so what you see is alarmingly disproportionately high rates uh, for our communities. Um, when it comes to stalking, bisexual women also experience nearly double the rate, and transgender women are 2.5 times more likely to experience stalking as compared to um, women who are not transgender. And so kind of in wrapping that up, because a lot of people will ask why, you know, why, why do we see such high rates of violence affecting these communities? And, you know, one of the reasons for me doing the work that I do day to day is recognizing that this violence is happening within a broader social context of bias, of biphobia, which is very real um, and, and hugely damaging and harmful to our communities. It's happening within a broader context of 
uh, racism, sexism, misogyny, anti-immigrant mentality, ableism, um, and many of the other uh, ways that our lesbian and bisexual identified and trans non-binary people continue to walk through the world um, oppressed and discriminated against on a regular basis. And what that then leads to, and I'll cover that a little bit more, I think, in the next question, are all the barriers that come from this broader, broader social context in which people are experiencing violence. I'm going to move on to the next question so we can move forward. Um, Kara, this year I become eligible for Medicare. <laughs> Got here, man. I don't know how. Got here, though. Dang. <laughs> Suddenly I'm thinking about my aging needs, right? <laughs> how do I grow old actively? Got a gimp knee, got a cranky old hip, bad back, what the heck? How do you afford getting old? Um, how do you stay socially engaged? Um, you know, I think what's important when we think when we start talking about lesbian and bisexual women in older adulthood is that their rates of poverty are much higher than the rest of the LGBT population. Um, and marriage equality only passed a few years ago. So many of the folks that I work with may have had long term partners that they never married and they have no access to the Social Security benefits that would be available to them. So I have folks that have been with partners for 30 and 40 years. Those folks passed away and they have no access to those benefits that they would have received easily and would have potentially assisted them into their retirement age um, if they were straight. So I think that there's, there's that lack of resources that we're always looking at and talking about. And then there's health disparities that kind of come in contact with those things. So um, our older um, lesbian and bisexual women are high, have higher rates of depression have um, higher rates of alcoholism overall. Um, they are less likely to have families um, to take care of them in adulthood. So they are less likely to have family supports and are more likely on the resilient side to have chosen family supports. So peers and other folks that are gonna jump in and help them. Um, so there's, there's a lot of disparities around that and opportunities, I think, to provide additional supports to folks um, as they're aging. Um, and as, you know, I think the costs are expanding. So we know in the next, um, if we kind of look at the population growth of seniors in the next um, 10 years, just so you can kind of get a sense of it, by 2030, 20%, a full 20% of our population in the United States will be seniors. And with declining birth rates, that's just going to continue to escalate. So we are really sort of facing what we're kind of coining as a sort of the silver tsunami of seniors that are absolutely going to be utilizing a larger degree of health services and benefits and needs as they're aging. Um, so as a culture and as a society, we need to start beginning to look at ways that we can kind of uh, support a larger infrastructure for folks as they're aging, as they're experiencing a lot of health issues um, and looking at what are the opportunities because um, it's not really going to be about building more assisted livings or more nursing cares because that's extremely expensive. Um, what I think it should look like is looking at ways in which we can help folks age in place within their homes and within their communities to help support them in those locations. Um, because ultimately, that's a, it's a much more affordable and much safer and a better plan for older adults who um, are... 80% um, of LGBT older adults um, are extremely fearful about going into long-term care placement because they feel like it will likely put them back in the closet because it feels very unsafe to them. They experience higher rates of discrimination. Some of that was covered in some of the slides this morning. Um, so those fears are really prohibiting them to, for even considering long-term care options if there is one available to them based on their financial situation. Um. One more question. I'm going to start with Robin, but I'd like you all to, to answer it. And uh, one of the greatest gifts of coming out for me was meeting so many amazing, resiliently spirited people who have such a great sense of humor and are just fearless in life, which is not how I was raised. I was raised to be afraid of almost anything. And it was like, whoa, I suddenly got up in my face, this a remarkable group of people. Um, what in your work with lesbian, bisexual, and, sexual, and queer women has 
inspired you or most surprised you? For me, it's been mostly because we've been talking about you know, the youth in foster care that um, that they get up every day and try to live their life in the best way that they can. Um, you know, all kids in foster care, you know, come in with a ton of trauma. That's why they're removed from their home. That's why, you know, they're in, that's why they're in foster care. And sometimes they're not treated so great in foster care either. But, you know, LGBT youth in foster care are just re-traumatized over and over again. They, it's, you know, three times as hard to find placements for them. They wind up um, in psychiatric hospital time, you know, much more than, you know, their peers. They, in one study, you know, 56% of them stated that they would rather be homeless because they felt safer there than in their foster or group home. Um, you know, so they're terrified. And even though they're, I mean, there's been actually a lot of laws these past couple of years that have changed for the better to protect them. But, you know, you still have foster parents who have their own biases. You still have social workers who have their own biases. So the fact that, the fact that they are able to get up, get dressed, go to school, want to, you know, want to find a way to make their life work, you know, it is amazing. And, you know, we're talking about young people, you know, 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds, you know, 15-year-olds who, you know, consciously make a choice to live on the street so they can go to school instead of living in a group home where they're going to get beat up. So... Um, so I think when I when I think about um, the older adults that I work with, I think about their resilience. Um, I think about the political climate that they experienced for the last 60 years, the way in which they grew up, the activism that they participated in, um, the families, the, like the chosen families and the strength that they created around that, um, their self-advocacy, which is extremely strong um, and as a community has really brought them together um, overall. So I think about those strengths. I also think about the intergenerational opportunities that are before us as a community, as an LGBT community, to be able to um, utilize the experience of older adults to support folks that are in foster care or transition age youth who don't have an adult person in their lives that identify as LGBT to be able to provide support and mirroring and provide that history and that sharing as folks come of age, which is something that in our community we haven't been able to really have until now um, because we haven't had the experience of having enough folks that have been out for long enough in a safe enough society to be able to see what that's going to look like. So I think that that's an amazing opportunity for our community as we're moving forward to really support resilience, supporting resilience community across the board. Um, for me, it's, I don't believe anyone should go without access to health care, you know, um, especially lesbian, bisexual, and queer women who have the hardest time obtaining just even regular women's health care exams. You know, um, I'm very blessed to work for a statewide organization where if a person of our community says, like, you know, I need a physician, I don't know how to navigate my insurance, I'm being denied access to care. What should I do? And I'm able to say like, okay, where are you at? Are you in San Bernardino? Are you in Reading? Are you in Imperial County? And connecting them to their local agency that provides LGBTQ services and help them get situated there so that way they can access healthcare services. You know, one of the things I did before I worked for the California LGBTQ Health and Human Services Network was I worked for the LGBT Center OC. And Orange County had this huge need for access to medical care for our community. So I started the LGBTQ healthcare department there and the Transgender Legal Assistance Clinic with a team of volunteer lawyers and law students 
to make sure that if they were discriminated against or if they were denied appeals um, that wasn't lawful, what could we do to, make, to take the next step by either going to DMHC or filing a discriminatory lawsuit against the facility? So for me, it's everyone. I don't care if you're a, a, a citizen, if you're undocumented, what your sexual orientation is or gender identity, everyone should be able to live a long, a happy, and healthy life. I, I really love what you had to say, and I think, you know, uh, my, my co-panelists really covered a lot of, of um, how the work can be fulfilling for, for different folks. I'm really interested in continuing to think about the barriers that our communities faces and, or that our communities face, and what can we be doing to help overcome those barriers. I think it's so important to name the barriers themselves and to do whatever it is that we can to dismantle those. And so whether that be innovative programming, like you just talked about bringing services to the community to overcome you know, geographic barriers, um, I think that that is so important. And you know, for me, in thinking about the way that we often talk about violence or even just what pops into our head when we hear the words domestic violence, we often don't see queer and trans folks reflected in those narratives. We often don't. Um, use inclusive pronouns when we talk about domestic violence and often those conversations really center around cisgender heterosexual women and what that does for us um, as queer communities is it makes us invisible and so it's so important to do our part to use inclusive language all the time everywhere in every space so that lgbtq people can see themselves reflected in these conversations and be able to think about um, the type of violence that they experience on a daily basis. I'd like to open it up. Anybody have some questions? Questions, questions, questions. There we go. Um, is there a good webinar training that can uh, train staff on um, gender inclusive language? Um, because that is often a stumbling block. I could answer that. Um, there's a few different um, websites. If you look at Gender Spectrum, Gender Spectrum, they should have. Um, and then I think it's all, there's also one Gender Odyssey. Odyssey. And both of them should have different webinars. I would also recommend LGBT Health Link. Um, they have a website. It is free to sign up, and you can access all of their webinars on how to make your medical facility more LGBTQ affirming. And then I would just um, I would just like to add that you know doing doing the work that it takes to create an inclusive organization is more than a webinar. Is more than you know than looking into these materials and really requires. Um, large ongoing um, commitments to learning, cultural humility, and institutional overhauls that really demonstrate a commitment on behalf of that organization to, um, to inclusivity. So I also highly recommend bringing in your local community-based organizations that have you know, experts that are doing work on the ground um, and, and working in LGBTQ-specific programming and then, and then resourcing those LGBTQ-specific exper experts to do that work. I apologize. I was just asking for the link again. I'm sorry. LGBT. It's oh. just health link. Oh, LGBT health link. Thank you. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, with racial equity lens, uh, a lot of times um, there's like a vision of what it would look like, like a checklist. If you, if you aspire to have an ideal program, um, these are the kinds of things that you would have in place. Is there such a checklist that you could just 
be envisioning to get towards so that you can cover all the bases? I, and we are in the process of getting training. Um, there, if you look at um, the Human Rights Campaign, they have a program called All Children, All Families, and they've actually done that for foster care and adoption agencies. So you can actually become certified by them as having your HRC seal, meaning you went through a whole program, you reached certain benchmarks, and you know have done certain things that have then become approved by HRC. And I know at some point they were talking about doing it for other types of facilities, but if you talk to somebody there, they might be able to give you some kind of you know spreadsheet that at least what you know they were looking for for us. I'm going to take one from the card and then another one <clears throat> on the microphone over here. Over there. Okay. Uh, please elaborate on the definition and difference between bi and versus queer. Sure. <laughs> Um, honestly, the difference between bi and queer is a personal interpretation. Um, my wife, for example, she likes to say that um, she's attracted to men and women, um, but she's also attracted to uh, trans people as well. Um, there are some people who are bi and or bisexual is very like cisgender men and women. Then there's people who are just they don't look at anatomy; they look at you know the person themselves. Um, but that also goes for queer. Um, but queer really has a lot of definitions because there can be someone who says my sexual orientation is queer and I'm in a queer relationship. So for instance, for me, I'm in a queer relationship because, um, again, my wife's bi and I am, I love everyone. So we, I don't like to say we're straight, even though sometimes my gender expression is male. But queer for us fits. So it really is a personal definition um, based on the person you're talking to and how they themselves define it. Good morning. Um, my name is Yvette, and I just wanted, you know, part of public health is like uh, claiming space and creating spaces for conversations and dialogue. So I wanted to ask you all what your thoughts and opinions were on queer people of color and queer women of color specifically, and um, how, yes, we are queer women, but how, you know, sometimes. That doesn't always mean inclusivity for mm -hmm. people of color, women of color. I think, you know, I see every day in my practice how um, how that intersectional lens in terms of the broader social context of oppression affects our clients. And we do know, um, based on studies looking at the national anti-violence programs, that the communities that are the most impacted by violence are communities of color, immigrant communities, um, lesbian and bisexual women of color, trans women of color, and um, and this bias really leads to extreme forms of violence that we need to be naming, and thank you for naming that in this space. And what that ends up looking like is higher levels of homicide in particular for trans women of color, in particular for trans black women, and in particular for uh, trans indigenous uh, women. Here in the United States, we've seen extremely high and alarmingly high levels of violence, and it is so important to have an intersectional framing in the conversations that we're having if we are dedicated as queer and trans communities to building healthy communities and making sure that, as you said, that, um, that we have uh, the ability to live our lives free from violence. Does that answer your question, or would you like more? I thank you guys very much. Um, one thing I just wanted to say, there's a book, I, I'm totally spacing out on the name and I don't, oh sure, hi. Um, I don't remember the name, but I think it's by Michael Shelton. It's called like Elements of LGBT uh, Treatment. And in the back of the book they have um, is a self-assessment and an agency assessment on LGBT competency. Um, that might be useful. Um, my question, so I, I run a recovery bridge housing program for people who identify as having a marginalized sexual orientation or gender identity or anything like that. We don't police identities or anything. Um, and so we're very, we're very open. We're the only, LG, well, 
LGBT um, recovery bridge housing program in the county right now. Uh, so obviously we don't have enough space for our communities. A lot of times, um, especially with trans and gender nonconforming people, are uh, often have to make a decision about do I want to be housed with people that would ensure my physical safety versus do I want to be housed with people which will allow me to live in my own identity? How do we as providers um, sort of address that? I mean, at my program, nothing is gendered. Like, we, d we don't do that, but I don't know that, that there's very many other programs like that, especially for transmasculine people where, where the risks are extremely high. Um, how, what, what is your guys' recommendation about that kind of thing? How can agencies make it both physically and emotionally safe for people so not put in a position to have to make that decision? Um, am I on? Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, some of the laws that have changed in the foster care world um, that never existed before is that well, the first thing is, you know, whether or not, you know, the the youth, the young adults are even coming out. So up until a couple of years ago, we had no idea how many LGBTQ youth were even in L.A. County foster care. So in 2014, there was um, a large study done by the Williams Institute, and it turned out that there were 19% of the kids ages 12 to 21. So out of, um, I think it was about 7,400 youth, um, 1,400 of them identified um, as LGBT, and I think 5% of that as trans. And I mean, it was hard enough finding a home for a gay or lesbian youth, but you know, a, a trans child or young adult was impossible. I would get a call on a Monday for a trans youth, and everyone would call our agency because they knew we had so many LGBT parents waiting, you know, for placement, that they just assumed that they would take all of the LGBT teens. Um, you know, but they wanted babies like everybody else. Um, so I would get a call on a Monday for, uh, you know, a trans youth, and then I'd get a call on a Thursday for the same trans youth, and then two weeks later for the same trans youth, because there was absolutely no place to put them. Part of that was because of room regulations and how, you know, foster care regulations were. You can only stay in the same room of the same gender up until a certain age, and all of these crazy regulations. So since then, actually now, um, the law was changed so that kids can be placed in a room with, as the gender that they identify with, not as what's on their birth certificate or the court records. So now, you know, they can be placed, there's not those strict regulations where there might not be a space for them. So that's opened up more room for them. Um, there's been more mandated training for foster parents, for social workers. So now every year, um, every foster parent, um, every social worker has to have training on LGBT issues. So they're, tr you know, we're trying to you know, make it as, I mean, I don't know if comfortable is, you know, the right word. I mean, we, we can make them do the training, you know, we could make them open up their, you know, house and then, you know, hopefully it goes well from there. But, um, I'd like, but to ask, least, I'd like to ask something. I apologize. Uh, are you saying in the environment that you're, um, the housing that you're providing that or or is was it a general question well I mean, I mean in my agency we don't gender rooms or anything like that okay. but I think I'm asking sort of like okay you, a trans or gender non-conforming person walks in to a supportive residential program and they're asked would you like to be housed with the men or the women 
whatever, it, there's a choice that has to be made, especially for trans masculine folks, right? Do I want to be housed in a situation that might be physically unsafe to me, which honors my Do you have the identity? microphone? Is that the microphone? Yeah. Um, just so a choice would need to be made. Do I want, sorry, do I want to be housed as a trans masculine person um, with cisgendered men, which might be physically dangerous, but honoring of my own identity, or do I want to be housed with cisgender mm -hmm. women in a situation which would be a total um, violation of my gender identity where, where I'd be physically safer? So the issue is a lack of housing or what I what rang to my ear was safety. Yeah, well, safety. How, so how do we as does providers create a space where that choice doesn't exist? Yeah. That's yeah. my question. So yeah. I, I thank you for asking that question because that's a really great question. Um, as someone who has been 5150 multiple times while coming to terms with my gender identity and um, a former um, alcoholic and drug addict as well, I'm now seven years clean, thank God. But when I, thank you, <laughs> but when, I had to go through residential treatments. Um, I really loved the fact that I was asked, you know, like, okay, so we know you're just starting your transition. Where would you feel the most comfortable? First off, where would you like to be placed that would affirm and not harm your mental health? And right away, my thought was, well, of course, with the men. And then the second question was, okay, we have no problems placing with the, with you with the men. What can we do? to make sure you feel safe while housed in that unit? And it was like, oh, well, I don't know. Like, that's a really great question. And I actually had someone sit down with me and go over a plan. Like, okay, so we're going to have a nurse check on you every 15 minutes. If you need a buddy for anything, this is going to be your go-to person. You know, it's a specific nurse or orderly um, that I felt safe and comfortable with who understood LGBT identities. Um, if there, if um, I felt I was being bullied or harassed or if my safety was threatened in any way, um, they would calmly take care of the situation by removing that person out without letting everyone else know. So that way um, people wouldn't feel like, oh, well, of course the trans person caused an issue, you know, like it, it was done in a very safe way. But by giving me that support system and giving me an orderly or a nurse that was my buddy for the day and even throughout the night who consistently checked on me um, and that I had a safe person to go to really helped me to feel safe while helping my mental health with being housed with where I identified it. Thank you, Danny. Good person to talk to. Hey. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, this question is from Mieko. Hi, so uh, earlier you had mentioned a statistic about bisexual women experiencing higher rates of um, interpersonal violence, and I, I think I've seen similar statistics as well. Um, are you aware if those bi women are experienced that in relationships with men um, or women or you know other gender partners, um, and what types of support or outreach are you providing to those bisexual women? Thank you for that question. Um, so. The overwhelming majority of bisexual women who are falling into that statistic are experiencing violence um, that is um, the, the, the person engaged in harm in that relationship is overwhelmingly a cisgender man. Um, the way that we see this play out, right, is, um, is that biphobia becomes part of a tool that that person uses to continue to maintain power and control um, over the survivor in that situation. And, um, and so uh, one of the things that I think has been the most heartbreaking for me as a provider is that often uh, bisexual identified women um, in that context may feel that because they're in what is a hetero cis presenting relationship at the time, that they won't have access to LGBTQ specific resources. And so that's why, again, going back to the importance of inclusive language and the importance of really dismantling biphobia and really supporting bi uh, uh, bisexual and queer identities is so important so that people can continue to see themselves fall within um, who is intended to be served by LGBTQ specific programs. And we are there uh, for those survivors. And we are important and critical for those survivors because we understand 
the way that biophobia is affecting their life, the way that it intersects with how they are experiencing violence, the barriers they face in trying to attempt to access the safety and protection that is supposed to be set in place to protect them, but often is not doing that, that often is making their queerness invisible as they move within those systems. Um, and so for us, it really starts with inclusive language. It really starts with um, being out at meetings in community, to, uh, reminding folks to use inclusive language during those meetings and making sure that uh, that that queer identities and bisexual identities are are reflected in our outreach materials, are um, that, that folks really know that we are there as a resource, among other steps that we take to do outreach specifically to folks who may uh, fall into that uh, that situation or experience. Um, how do we do in the USA in comparison with other countries in terms of LGBTQ acceptance, social services, and health support? Are there any role models out there that we would like to emulate more? That says a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so we're on the cutting edge here. Uh, do you all have funding sources or recommendations to get sexual health support and ST and sex testing or ST STI testing at our organization or community sites? It would fund, do you have funding or funding sources or recommendations to get health support and testing at organizations and community sites? Am I answer, asking that correctly? Yes, I got a nod, yes. Well, um, youth in foster care, they all have Medi-Cal, so they can go to any medical facility that accepts Medi-Cal and get health care. Um, I would say that look at your community partnerships because um, many different um, STI providers do mobile um, work. So some folks have vans and other kinds of things, and they may be willing mobile, to do. Mobile yeah, testing. they may be willing to do testing at your location a few times a month if you develop a partnership. You know, I think that there is often resources that can be shared. Yeah, reaching out in your own community, and if you reach across to another city. Um, everybody is usually willing to help or, or brainstorm with you on how to solve your problem because we've all had to go through it on some level or another. So networking is really important. Um, Would it be possible, can I circle back around to the prior question? Sure. I, I think um, the just char the, the characterization as, of the, as the U.S. being on the cutting edge, I, I would like to kind of just unpack that a little bit. Um, I, I, I said earlier that some of the work that I do is with the American Bar Association, and one of the projects that we're working on right now is we're going into states that have hostile or unfriendly laws uh, when it comes to LGBTQ communities. And so we're going into those states, we're training their court providers, their judiciary, um, their attorneys on how to increase access, like I said, overcoming barriers um, to the courts for LGBTQ folks. There is a lot of work to do. Uh, across the country, I've seen it firsthand. Um, we've been to uh, to states that that do not have inclusive laws for LGBTQ people. Just as an example, in North Carolina, um, the courts are actually segregated by gender right now. In 2019, you walk into a courtroom, you are asked to go to either one or the other side. It is a binary demarcation in the courts. In that same state, if you are an LGBTQ survivor of domestic violence you are not eligible for a domestic violence restraining order. That is true in 2019. The statute is written as opposite sex. And if you are in a relationship that is not opposite sex, you do not meet the definition of experiencing domestic violence and you're not eligible for a restraining order. So I think we have a lot of work to do in terms of creating inclusivity uh, across the country. In many locations that I've been to, I'll be uh, going with uh, the ABA next week to another project. Um, folks don't ask about sexual orientation, gender identity. Some community providers um, have, you know, expressed blatant um, bias uh, having been in those spaces. So I do think that that's an important thing for us to, to keep in mind. And I want to apologize to the entire group because I made a joke about something that's not funny. It's not funny. 
And I had an opportunity at one point in time to go up and speak at an LGBT church, MCC church, up in <clears throat> uh, the central California area on the coast. And I was all excited to go up there and get to speak at this wonderful church. And, and what I was shocked about in the area and at the church is that only everybody only went by their first name because they were afraid to be outed because most of them weren't out and the church was held in the cafeteria of a grade school. And they jobs were so scarce, they did not want to be fired if their boss was prejudiced. And I, it, I was stunned that this was happening in California, stunned. So we are in a little bit of a a mecca with our own problems here in Southern, in Southern California and in Los Angeles County in that we have access to services and we're having a conversation about it. But you drive out of town, let alone across the United States, into one of these other states and you're not going to have much of a conversation about it because people are afraid. So we, there's a lot of work to be done. And people in this room are going to be some of the leaders of getting some of this work done because you have a vision for it. You understand what needs to be done and you'll be able to step forward in your lives and in your work. Was there a question? Yes, please. Oh, okay. Hi, good morning and thank you so much for enriching uh, me this morning with all of your experience and your input. My name is Kathy Rush. I teach at um, Cal State Northridge and I'm also the senior trainer at Tarzana Treatment Centers. Um, my question and my comments are almost in response to just what we've been talking about here. And, um, and Danny, it's Danny. Danny, I'm so grateful you had the experience you had um, in your um, treatment um, pathway. Um, in my experience, and I've been working with Tarzana Treatment Centers on and off for almost 30 years, I'm proud to say I'm 58 years old. Um, I thought you were just showing off when you said 39. <laughs> um, um, and, but in my experience, that's not the norm. We don't have the kind of staffing that can provide a buddy system. We don't have the kind of staffing or um, uh, environment of care that can check in with a patient every 15 minutes. Um, and while that should be should be a goal and, and should be the standard of care, my reality is that it is not. Um, and so I think it's important just to recognize that reality and to look at those, those elements of cultural awareness, cultural competency, just um, best practices and standard of care that can be implemented. And I'm wondering if any of you have any thoughts about that. Um, certainly it comes back to, for me, training. Obviously that's my love, education, training. And I'm wondering if any of you have any thoughts to contribute about the idea of different certifications and licensure and um, medical degrees that we should be looking at the education starting there. That it's, that it's, you know, not about already these agencies that are up and running and how do we now infuse cultural competency? How do we now speak to these, you know, populations that are becoming the majority and that are no longer the minority? Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about that. It's something that I try to infuse in, in the kids that I educate at the university that it's, it's got to start way before we land where we are and if you're aware of any advocacy or um, you know work being done in that way that's trying to affect those kinds of entities um, and institutions where we learn very early on how to care for our community more holistically mm -hmm. um, and the last thing I just want to say is Tarzana Treatment Center is very available in services and transitional housing, substance use disorder treatment, mental health treatment. And I don't even mean this as a plug, I mean it as a resource. If you're looking to refer folks, we are very, very open armed to um, uh, this community. I apologize, I'm gonna need to cut the speakers off. Thank you so much for saying that. It's a wonderful way to end, that we think forwardly 
by starting earlier and getting our training ourselves. One of the wonderful um, notes here was, have we contemplated making the tra training mandatory <laughs> because it's very informative and in learning. What we can do and what we do offer you is free training by our group. We will come to your employment. We will come wherever you want us to come and train your um, staff or your people. And uh, Bobby, can you stand up? Here's one of our trainers right now. She just happened to be here. <laughs> we have wonderful, talented people who will come to you and sit with you and talk with you and train your entire staff. And also we have, these are very important pieces of paper in your folder. Please don't discard them. Please look at them. Uh, the Healthy Quality Index. Bring your, bring your facility up to speed. This is how to do it. They'll help you. Call them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're wonderful. Get your cards out. Network. Network. The answers are in this room. And please visit the tables outside.